Lord, thank you indeed that you have paid it all. That through your life, death, and resurrection, you've indeed washed us white as snow. We thank you that, again, we can come together, your people, to hear your truth and your word that you have revealed to us. We pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive it. Lord, that it would indeed transform our minds, transform our lives, would edify us, rebuke us, Lord. Lord, we are just so grateful that you have chosen to reveal to us all that we need to know to be saved in you. We thank you in Christ. Amen. May be seated and take with me, if you will, in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 5. We have seen up to this point in Mark's gospel, from the very, very first verse, Mark is eager to declare to us and demonstrate to us and provide evidence for us that Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Son of God, the eternally begotten, truly and only Son of the living God. We've seen him thus far as Lord over diseases, Lord over physical incapacities. He's Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, last week we witnessed him as Lord of the storm, or even just by his voice. He was able to look at the wind and the sea and say, hush, and it was calm instantly, immediately. But what about things that are unseen? What about things that we can't perceive? And especially, what about forces of evil and wickedness that are beyond our immediate perception. It is one thing to say that Jesus is Lord of creation, that he is Lord of nature, that he is Lord of the wind and the seas, and there is a measure of comfort in that, but it is not every day that we face a storm. It is not every day that we face the tempest of an ocean or the gale of the wind unto our destruction, but it is every day that we face evil. It is every day that we face powers unseen to us that seek to do us harm, that seek to do harm to the church of Jesus Christ, that seek to blaspheme publicly and outwardly and constantly the name of God. What about those things? What about these powers of darkness? What is the relationship of Jesus to these powers of evil? that we are maybe only peripherally aware of. And there are two errors, I think, that are confronted, two errors that are common, and, 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 and if we're honest, all of us are prone to either or, or maybe even a mixture of these two errors. But the text is sort of an antidote to this kind of thinking. One of them is dualism. Dualism, I call this the George Lucas theology. This is the light and the dark are a competition to each other, with each other, and we just never know which side is going to be victorious. And it's this idea of the yin and the yang, and there's this constant tension between good and evil. They are equal but opposite forces, and we just can't be certain which is going to win. The text confronts us with that, and it doesn't allow dualism to take root in our minds if we pay attention to what the text teaches us. But there's a second error. It's the denial of evil at all. Or it's a minimization of evil. To say that that evil can be explained, what we perceive as wickedness can be explained purely by nature. That in the evil man, it's not really that he's wicked in his heart, it's that he's not educated. Or society has failed him in some way. Or there's some natural cause for the wickedness and for the evil that, that he does and for the wicked and the evil that abides within him. But brothers and sisters, it will be to our great peril if we deny or if we minimize the reality, the existence, the power of unseen forces in our day. It's to our great peril if we forsake the Scripture's teaching on these things. We are quite literally surrounded by forces 
of darkness that defy our imaginations as to both their power and their cruelty. It is to our peril if we ignore or minimize what the, teach, what the scriptures plainly teach, that we are surrounded by forces of evil, the power and cruelty of which we can't even fathom. But the spirit of our age is various forms of secular humanism. Our culture wants to find natural explanations for all the things that we observe. The overwhelming impulse of our culture is to, not, to deny the reality of the supernatural at all to look for natural explanations for all things. And man wants to rule and control his own domain. He wants to control his own world, so, he, so he, must be, he must pretend that everything in the world that he can see and touch and handle and measure, that that's all that there is. And that he can control, can control all of it. That given enough time, given enough ingenuity, given enough resources, he can control even the climate itself. Imagine the hubris. Imagine the pride of man. I was discussing some of these things with a dear brother and sister recently. We were talking about the, the, the feeling sometimes. We don't want to say there's a demon under every bush, there's a demon under every rock, and yet the reality is there are unseen powers at work within us. And I, I recalled that there was an article from, an essay from Tim Challies years ago, and I couldn't, even, I couldn't find it, but he had an insightful point. He said, you know, we, we to, we're told the plain teaching of the Scripture is that we battle not, or we battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. We know that explicitly from the Scripture. The world, the flesh, and the devil, that triad. And yet, and he, he admitted, I'm, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush, general terms, but in general terms, depending on kind of what theological camp you're in, you may emphasize one of those to the exclusion of the other two. And he said, so among the charismatics, for instance, that the emphasis tends to be on the devil, to the neglect of the, the peril of the world and the flesh. In, in the more fundamentalistic, fundamentalist camps, the emphasis seems to be on the dangers of the world and forsaking worldliness and separating from the world and a denial sometimes of the problems of your own flesh and the errors and the, and the dangers of the supernatural. And then among those who are more conservative and reformed and reformed-ish, the emphasis seems to be on the dangers of the flesh. The dangers of our own flesh to the neglect of the dangers of the world and the dangers of the devil. And the answer, as he wrote, was not for any of those camps to minimize what they naturally tend to focus upon, but to recognize the full measure of the threat of the other two. I think it's wise words. And so for those of us who are reformed, who are Committed cessationists. We talked about this this morning in Sunday school. God's use, he's not, his freedom to work outside and against even above ordinary means. God is free to work supernaturally. But God is not the only supernatural agent at work in this world. In Mark chapter 5, we're going to read in a moment verses 1 through 20. It serves as a reality check for us, maybe. It may serve as a reality check for you. We must not deny the presence and the power of unseen spirits in our day. And at the same time, at the very same time, we must look to the Lord Jesus as the one who has conquered Satan, who's put him to open shame, and has promised to throw, all, to throw the devil and all of his demons into the bottomless pit. And they will be judged and tormented for eternity. And so we have to think about, in our text this morning, the title of the sermon is Lord Over Unseen Powers. But the first thing we have to consider, and it's an unpleasant thing to think about, but we must consider it, and the text makes it inescapable for us to meditate upon this, is the reality and the cruelty of unseen powers. The reality and the cruelty of unseen powers. But secondly, the overwhelming authority and mercy of Jesus. The overwhelming authority and mercy of Jesus. And then lastly, let's consider the varied responses to the person and the work of the Son of God. How do men respond to the Son 
of the living God. Let's read together the text of Scripture. Follow along with me, if you will, in your copy of God's Word as I read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. This is the Word of God. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of me, or come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Then the herdsmen fled and told it to the city and the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had 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 the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Notice in the first place, the unsettling, the uncomfortable, the unpleasant reality and cruelty of unseen powers. It's undeniable from the text, and again, we have this tendency culturally, and don't think that we're immune to that, we want to find the natural explanation for this. And so classic liberalism has, uh, uh, Christian liberalism has come to this text and said, well, I know it says that he was possessed by demons, but really that was the frame of the mind of the ancients in their naivete, in their lack of scientific awareness. What this was really, we're really dealing with was he was a schizophrenic. He was mentally impaired. He was in a frenzy of some kind. And demon possession is just what they called it. Brothers and sisters, that isn't true. The scriptures are true. This man was possessed, not by one demon, but we're going to see by perhaps thousands of demons. This was an actual demonic possession. Now, the the, the setting here, Jesus has just calmed the wind and the waves. They're still in the same boat upon the same sea, and they cross over to the other side. And immediately as they get off, of the boat, they're confronted with this man. Now, this was in a region known as the Decapolis, from the Greek word deca and polis, the ten cities. And so this was in that that region. This was a Gentile land populated by almost exclusively Gentiles, although there were a measure of Jews and particularly apostate Jews in this region. And everything that we encounter immediately in the story is unclean. The land itself is unclean. It's Gentile land. Here is a man who lives among dead bodies. He lives in tombs. See, around Lake the the Sea of Galilee, there were these tall limestone cliffs, and the tombs would have been carved out. Some of them were very elaborate. Some were multiple rooms. They were caves. They were tombs. And this man lived there. But he's also possessed by unclean spirits. So everything here is unclean. And yet Jesus goes to this land 
intentionally, purposefully, with no fear of himself being defiled, he goes and he sets foot on pagan land. The Jews, when they would have to cross through a Gentile territory, they would shake the dust off of their feet when they entered back into Jerusalem or back into to Judah or Jerusalem or Israel because they were concerned about the defilement that they had picked up. Jesus had no such concern because he is the leavening effect. He is the purifying effect. But the problem in this event is far worse than ceremonial uncleanness. The problem with this man was not that he was among dead bodies. The problem was not that he lived in a Gentile land. The problem was that he was possessed by evil spirits. The problem was spiritual. The problem was quite literally demonic. And we need to do the unpleasant business this morning of kind of thinking through biblically what what are the implications of this. We need to meditate briefly this morning on the reality and the horror and the cruelty of unseen evil. Sometimes we prefer not to think about these things. Sometimes we'd much prefer the secular humanism as a frame of reference because it seems neater, it seems tidier, it seems more controllable. And our culture is inundated with depictions of, of, of angels. And particularly this time of year, as you see Advent scenes and nativity scenes, and there's always angels, and what do they look like? They're sweet, they're cute, they're little cherubs. And they've got their little wings and their little halos, and they're all so sweet and controllable. Well, brothers and sisters, that's not the picture we find in the scriptures of angels, is it? It's not anywhere close. This is not the truth of scripture. God created the heavens, He created the earth, and as part of His creation, He created spiritual beings as His ministers with power that you and I cannot even fathom. In Psalm 104, The the psalmist declares he makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. These are spiritual beings. They don't have a body like men. And Satan, his demons, we know are what? They're fallen angels. And when they fell, they lost all opportunity to be reconciled to God. They, They were given over to the full measure of their venom and their sin, but they did not lose their power and their magnificence and to their glory. They are not omnipotent. They are not omniscient. They are not everywhere. They are not, they are limited still. And they are subservient to God, as we will see. But let's not escape the reality that angels, either preserved angels or fallen angels, angels are some cute little character that we can control. We must remind ourselves from the scriptures because we're immersed with these images. And and we we need to fight against this kind of thing. As Paul said in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Now think about what do we know from the scriptures about these angelic beings. And, And most of our information from the scriptures about angels comes in the form of God's ministers, God that are still serving God. But we know that angel or that demons are fallen angels. So the Old Testament, for example, and I'm going to give you some examples, records for us Balaam. Remember Balaam, when he meets an angel on the road, he fell off of his donkey with his face in the dust because of the majesty and of the glory of this angelic being that appeared before him. And he's just, boom, he's on his face in the dirt. You'll recall that in the book of Genesis, where records for us where God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but God didn't do that immediately. He didn't do it by his own immediate hand. He did it by what means? He sent two angels, two, just two. And they accomplished a level of destruction that's almost unimaginable. Just two angels. I mean, we, we, we fret and we worry about things like nuclear weapons, which are nothing compared to the power that God has disposed or given to the disposal of angelic beings. Remember Daniel? The mighty Daniel who looked a lion in the eyes that didn't flinch. Remember when Daniel met Gabriel the first time? And Daniel testifies himself. He said, so he came near where I stood. This is in Daniel 8. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is, vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. The man who didn't flinch, looking eyeball to eyeball with a lion, fell on his face in fear. 
before an angel. And what about Mary and her friends when they went to the tomb that early Sunday morning? They went to the tomb of Jesus, and there was standing there before them an angel with a face like lightning, and they were afraid. They were terrified. They were in dread when they saw such things. And even John the Apostle, who had witnessed things, had been an eyewitness to things that boggle the mind, and even John the Apostle testified that when he saw an angel, he fell down like a dead man. A dead man. He was powerless and he was overcome with fear. I mean, these beings are majestic. They are glorious. They are mighty. And every single time in the scriptures that men are confronted with angels, they fall down utterly helpless. If an angel were to appear to us this morning, the universal reaction of all of us is we would hit the ground in fear. We would be in utter awe of what we see. We would lose control of our faculties in the presence of such a being. And the scriptures teach to us that God made an innumerable number of these beings. A far greater number than we can fathom. They are all trained for war, intelligent, magnificent, powerful, organized into ranks, we dare not speculate too far about that reality, but it is true from the scriptures. They are awesome in every way when we compare them to the power and the faculties of human beings. And the scriptures teach to us that Satan and his demons are and remain such creatures. So we dare not think of unseen powers in a minimal way. It's to our own peril if we minimize or ignore the existence of such power. These innumerable fallen angels, also trained for war, also intelligent, also magnificent, powerful, organized into ranks. And we find immediately in this account of a man possessed, not by one of such creatures, but by a myriad of them. How many? Don't know. I don't know. But look at what the text tells us in verse 2. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And he lived among the tombs. And notice here the cruelty with which this demonic activity had subjected this man. Notice the cruelty. He lived among the tombs. He was isolated from humanity. He had no social contact. He had no self-control. He had no care for himself. He lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. Saints, there's no natural explanation for that. Epilepsy doesn't explain that. Schizophrenia doesn't explain that. Drugs doesn't explain that. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. This man didn't even get to sleep. He was tormented night and day and cut himself with stones. This would have been shavings or... or, or chippings off the limestone that were sharp, razor sharp, and he would cut himself with it. No attempt to explain this away in naturalistic terms does justice to the text. But here's the other problem. We'll see this in a few moments. If we go that route and try, try to, to naturalize this, try to explain this away, then all we are doing is diminishing the power and the authority and the glory of Christ when he redeems us. So in order to have the good news, we, we need to spend some time appreciating how bad the bad news is and how awesome and terrifying is the power that wages war against our souls. 
the power and the capability of the prince of the power of the air. We shouldn't blink. We shouldn't, we shouldn't shy away from this. And some object to this passage, particularly those who are, uh, I'm sure this is not the favorite passage of PETA, for example, uh, for the animal rights folks. They look at this and they obsess and focus on the cruelty to the animals. Well, there's two problems with that at least. Number one is Jesus is not the one who killed the swine. This was demonic. This was the force of evil that did this. But secondly, let this sink in. Let the horror of that picture in your mind sink in of 2,000 pigs. Can you imagine the noise, the squeals of 2,000 of them stampeding headlong to their deaths off the cliffs? And in just a few moments' time, Demons had accomplished that in 2,000 swine. What was the degree of torment they had subjected this human being to for who knows how long? If in moments they could do this to 2,000 animals, what do you think a moment in the mind and body of that man was like? The abject cruelty with which he was assaulted hour by hour, not a moment's respite, not even a sleep at night. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that such evil exists? Do you believe such horror, such demonic power exists? Do you believe it's actually present? And how much are we tempted to naturalize and look for rational, reasonable explanations for the wickedness that we see? We can look at wickedness of world rulers and assume this must be because their mother didn't hug them. It must be because society has done some horrible thing or politics went wrong rather than saying this is evil and it is wicked and it is demonically animated. That's not to say that every time we see a wicked man that he is fully possessed by a demon. But the whole world the scriptures tell us, is under the sway of the evil one. The whole world. Do you believe that evil is actually present everywhere? If if somehow, as as Elijah did with Elisha, and sort of peeled back the veil to see the forces of darkness around us, but also the angelic protection around us, we would be astounded. And I think in God's mercy, perhaps we don't see that or we might not get out of bed, ever. We see the evil in the world and we're far too often we seek to attribute that evil to some natural phenomenon. The saints, brothers and sisters, we need to train and discipline ourselves to recognize it for what it is. This is demonic. This is evil. I was listening to an interview with Rosario Butterfield. This is not in my notes. It's just coming to mind recently, and she was talking about her own repentance with respect to this, the transgender mess and her own sin of, of capitulating to the pronoun crowd out of a sense of wanting to be winsome and charitable. And she said, but it was sin, and public sin requires public repentance. This is a movement that is demonic, and she's right. She's not overstating it. It is demonic. And I look at the text here. Here's a man inhabited by these demons and he's cutting himself. And how many little boys and girls are being encouraged to cut themselves, to mutilate their bodies, hormonally and surgically, to destroy themselves? If that's not demonic, I don't know what is. Do we recognize that or we seek to a, do we seek a naturalistic kind of explanation? Jesus took it as a matter of just fact that the presence of evil and unbelief in the world was the work of these unseen powers. For example, when when he began to to tell his disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to be killed, that he was going to be handed over to wicked men, and Peter stood up and said, not on my watch, Lord. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. He recognized that that kind of impulse just as Peter's confession that Jesus is the Son of God did not come from Peter's own human mind, so too 
the impulse to thwart the plan of God did not come from Peter's own human mind. To one, Jesus gave the credit, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for your Father in heaven has revealed this to you. But here he says, get behind me, Satan. We saw just a couple of weeks ago with the parable of the sower. When the sower goes out to sow his seeds and the seed falls upon the path and the s- Satan comes immediately, Jesus says, and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. It was Satan that did that. It wasn't their inattention. It wasn't they were distracted. It wasn't some other thing. Jesus says this is a demonic power at work to thwart the word of God taking root. Jesus understood that his enemies, the, the wicked rulers of the Jews, in fact, were animated in their evil schemes by Satan and his demons. In John chapter 4, Jesus says to them very plainly, can you imagine being a witness to this conversation? You are the father, you are of your father, the devil. Now, these were the most religious men anybody even knew. And he said, you are of the father, your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus recognized this. There was no natural explanation for the hatred of the Jews towards Jesus. They were animated by unseen powers of darkness. J.C. Ryle says, we may be sure that upon the subject of the devil and his power, we are far more likely to believe too little and too much. Unbelief about the existence and personality of Satan has often proved the first step to unbelief about God. Did you catch that? Unbelief about the existence and personality of Satan has often proved the first step to unbelief about God. You won't have to search far to find examples of that. In your own circles, probably. Raul goes on, he says, we probably have not the faintest idea of the number, subtlety, and activity of Satan's agents. We forget that he is king over an enormous host of subordinate spirits who do his will. He would probably find, or we would probably find, if our eyes were open to see spirits, that they are about our path and about our bed and observing all our ways to an extent of which we have no conception. In private and in public, in church and in the world, there are busy enemies ever near us of whose presence we are not even aware. Being reformed doesn't stop us from saying amen to that. So serious was Jesus about the presence and the reality of demonic power that didn't he teach his disciples to pray, deliver us from the evil one? Week by week, when we recite together the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray, one of the petitions, the sixth petition, is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In the Westminster Larger Catechism, and as its name implies, the answers are a little longer, but it deals with this, what is that sixth petition all about? What do we pray for in that petition? And in the sixth petition, which is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, the answer is acknowledging that the most wise, righteous, and gracious God for diverse, holy, and just ends may so order things that we may be assaulted, foiled, and for a time led captive by temptations. That Satan, the world, and the flesh are ready powerfully to draw us aside and ensnare us. And that we, even after the pardon of our sins, by reason of our corruption, weakness, and want or lack of watchfulness, are not only subject to be tempted and forward or inclined to expose ourselves unto temptations, but also of ourselves unable and unwilling to resist them, to recover out of them, and to improve them, and worthy to be left under the power of them, we pray, that God would so overrule the world and all in it, subdue our own flesh and restrain Satan, order all things, bestow and bless all means of grace, and quicken us to watchfulness in the use of these means, that we and all his people may by his providence be kept from being tempted to sin. Or, if tempted, that by his Spirit we may be powerfully supported 
and enabled to stand in the hour of temptation, or when fallen, raised again, and recovered out of the temptation and the sin, and have a sanctified use and improvement thereof. That our sanctification and salvation may be perfected, Satan trodden under our feet, and we fully freed from sin, temptation, and all evil forever. It's a lot to pray for in that simple phrase, isn't it? Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. Because there's a recognition, as Jesus taught his disciples, there's evil all around us. We can't even see it. And yet the prayer reminds us, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray in this way, not only does it remind us of the power and the presence of evil spirits, but more importantly, because of the overwhelming authority and mercy of our triune God revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to pray. Because God has not sent us into this world. He's not caused us to be born into a world full of unseen powers, mighty beyond our comprehension, and left us no resources. Left us without protection. Left us without opportunity to be rescued. He taught his disciples to pray, believing that God, through the Son, has overcome all evil. And so we, and we observe this very visibly in our text after we see the, the power and the cruelty of these demons as they inhabit this man, they come as Jesus steps out of the boat. We're told immediately that he saw Jesus from afar. He ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Now, this is the voice of the demons speaking. I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Matthew says, do not torment me before the time. Even the demons knew. Even the demons knew, number one, they were subject to God. But two, that they were going to be eternally judged. They didn't know when, they didn't know by what means, but they knew that he would be judged. Jesus was saying, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then Jesus asked his name, not because Jesus needed to know the name, not because Jesus did not know the name, but he was wanting to know, show for the demonstration, even of the crowds, the full scope of what was being dealt with here. What is your name? And the answer is, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, the, the word Legion, you probably know this, is a military term. The Romans used Legion to describe a group of soldiers that was six thousand strong. Now, whether there were actually a full 6,000, whether this was a full legion or not, we don't know. But the idea is, this was not one demon. This wasn't even just a handful of demons. And we know the demons went and possessed 2,000 swine. So the point of the text is not to be able to quantify precisely how many, but that it was a very large number of very powerful very cruel, unseen spirits. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And this is probably a reference not just to the geographic country, but don't send us yet to the bottomless pit. Don't send us out of this world yet. A great herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. And so he gave them permission. Martin Luther said, even the devil is God's devil. The unclean spirits, even in their multiplied numbers, did not even pretend to be a match for the Son of God. Now, we spent some unpleasant time contemplating the, the, the majesty, the power of such angelic beings, such fallen angels, and yet with thousands upon thousands of them, they trembled in fear at the very voice of Jesus who is the Christ. So again, if we seek to find a natural remedy, it's, it, was just, it, was, it was just a frenzy, it was just epilepsy, it was just schizophrenia, then we also minimize the power and the glory and the awesome power and mercy of Jesus on display. meditate, saints, upon this overwhelming, not only authority, but the mercy 
of Jesus. No one could bind this man. No one could help him. No one could deliver him. No one could save him. No one could protect him. No one could rescue him. And Jesus simply speaks. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, he records, Jesus just simply says, go. Just as he said to the sea and the waves, hush. He says to the demons, thousands of them, go. And they had no choice. Jesus rids this man of his demonic oppression with just his word. Jesus' authority over unseen powers, it is absolute, it is unchallenged, unassailable, indisputable. John Calvin, he says, we ought to be aware that they, meaning the demons, did not come under come on their own accord into the presence of Christ, but were drawn by a secret exercise of his authority. As they had formerly been accustomed to carry men off in furious violence to the tomb, so now a superior power compels them to appear reluctantly at the tribunal of their judge. Hence, we infer, we infer this, that the whole of Satan's kingdom is subject to the authority of Christ. For the devils, when Christ summons them to appear before them, are not more at their own disposable, disposal than were the wretched men from their tyranny was wont to drive about in every direction. At length, by the secret power of Christ, they are dragged before him that, by casting them out, he may prove himself to be the deliverer of men. Saints, behold your God. Behold the Son of God, who just by his voice, by his word, by his, by his compulsion says, go. Meditate upon that and think about then the, your own sin with which you struggle. And you think Jesus doesn't have the power to just simply say, go. And you labor and you strive in your own strength according to your own power, your own will. And you labor not against flesh and blood, but against unseen powers, against rulers and principalities in this present age. And the Lord Jesus stands before you with the power and the authority and the mercy to deliver you, to rescue you. And we've already contemplated the horror of these 2,000 swine rushing down headlong the slope into their death. And to think that even just in a few moments' time, the demons accomplished this. But behold, the mercy of the Son of God who had delivered this human being from such mercy. And, and don't, don't listen to those who would say, well, this was really cruel to the animals. Jesus says, are you of not much more value than many sheep? Doesn't this demonstrate that one human soul, even a human soul in a Gentile land who's cut himself from head to toe, who can't even be clothed, who's not in his right mind, and Jesus said, that one is worth 2,000 uh, pigs and more. Don't buy the philosophy of our age. It says the beasts of the field are the same as a human being. They are not. Scriptures teach to the contrary. And now, now this precious image bearer, this human body and soul, who still bears the scars, by the way, of his own sin, of his own demonic possession, and he sits now clothed in his right mind, in a place of humility, sitting at the teacher's feet. Now he sits at the feet of Jesus, He's attentive. He's humble. Brothers and sisters, do you view the miracle of regeneration, of new birth, as more awe-inspiring than the calming of a raging storm? Because we can look at the wind and the waves. It's not hard for us, even though we're not, most of us are not seafaring men, but it's not hard for us to imagine the roiling waves of the ocean and to hear the, the, the gale of the wind and think, oh, that's frightening, and for God to just... For Jesus to say, hush, and he goes quiet. That's awesome. And we have no problems, and that is incredible. But when one human being believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and by the power of the Holy Spirit is brought to new life, is born again, transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, do we stand with similar awe? Do we see that as even a greater miracle, a greater display of authority and power and mercy? The demon-possessed man is, is extraordinary. I mean, he, he is. I mean, very few people are literally inhabited by a demon, much less thousands of them. But he represents, in a sense, that which is common to every man, every woman, every child, every single human being comes into this world under the power of darkness, under the influence of Satan. He is their father. He is their Lord. He drives them. He animates them. They are under the sway and the power of sin and evil. And there are no exceptions to that, except the one born of a virgin, except the Lord Jesus Christ, the God to man. But every other human being is a son and daughter of Adam, inheriting his original guilt. There are no exceptions to that. Have you ever acknowledged that? Have you bowed yourself down before the Lord Jesus Christ and said, there is evil within me, not mistakes, not bad judgment. There is wickedness that resides within me. And there is one and only one deliverer for me. There is one and only one rescuer for me. The Lord Jesus Christ. And I need both his power and his mercy. I need his authority, and I need his compassion. Have you ever admitted to yourself and to the Lord that you are under the power and the sway of sin and evil? And for probably everyone in this room, that doesn't mean that you were ever personally inhabited or possessed by a demon. But you don't have to be. To be a product of demonic thought and to be influenced by the evil one. The scriptures plainly, clearly teach that every man, every woman, every child is driven by the prince of the power of the air, by unseen powers and authorities. Think further. What kind of torment was, must remain eternally for those who perish without the mercy of Jesus Christ? If it bothers us, if we kind of flinch just looking with our scriptural eye at this man, possessed by legion, cutting himself naked, foul and screaming out in the middle of the night, living in the tombs, people don't want to be near him. If we think that torment is hard to look at, it's hard to think about, what will it be like in eternity in hell? What kind of misery awaits the one who refuses the offer of mercy? From the Lord Jesus Christ. What awaits those who say, I want the evil. I'm comfortable with it. I don't want the new life in Jesus Christ. And that brings us very briefly to consider the responses. What happens next? <laughs> After these pigs crush over the cliffs to their death, what happens? The herdsmen flee. They tell it in far, far and away, far and, and wide. They tell it in the country, they tell it in the city, and the people come to see what's happened. And you expect, don't you, to think oh, people will come and they will see this man renewed, reborn, clothed now, in his right mind, speaking cohesively and, 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 and sitting humbly before the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will all fall on their faces and worship. But that isn't what happened, is it? See, we, we have this other lie that we believe sometimes. If only people had the right information, if only they had the right education, if only they had the right offer of the gospel, they would come. And most people would not. Because they don't want it. And there are really two, two responses when men encounter the Son of the living God. They respond in one of two ways. Either they humble themselves and they submit to the mercy and the authority of Christ. Or they reject Him and seek to put as much distance between him and themselves as they can. That's the reality, isn't it? 
People don't passively deny the gospel. People don't passively deny it. If they've settled in their minds, they do not want the Son of God. They seek to put as much distance as possible. And we see that here in the text. The men of the region ask Jesus to leave. But why would they ask him to leave? This is a problem that has plagued not just this man, but think about the, the, the social disorder of a man you can't even bind with chains. Think about what happened in those POA meetings. We got this guy that lives down by the cliffs and he's tormenting everybody, he's screaming all night. Can't somebody do something about that? And someone finally has, and they say, uh, can you go? Why? Because they preferred the comforts of this world. They looked at their economic loss and they focused on that. They looked at the disruption of their own social order and they focused on that. Faced with, his, with the clear power and victory of the Lord Jesus Christ over a legion of demons, they reveal that they're far more concerned with financial prosperity and status quo than they are the righteousness of God revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another response. The vast majority reject, but there's one. There's one who now, having been delivered from his sin, being delivered from the demons that, that inhabited him, he's now sitting at the feet of Christ. Think about and meditate upon the newness of this new man. Now, obviously, his contrast is stark. Obviously, naked to clothe. You can see that at 100 yards. But there was a newness in everything about him. This is a true picture of regeneration. A true picture of regeneration. And can you say that you now sit at the feet of Jesus, eagerly following him wherever he sends you, with whatever he commands you to do? And we can tell in some ways, the validity and the certainty of his conversion by the fact that he asked Jesus, can I go with you? And Jesus says, no. Now think about that. The demons asked Jesus a question and he permitted it. The people of the land say, will you please leave? And Jesus acquiesces. Probably not the right word. He didn't yield to them but he gave them what they asked for. His own new disciple asked, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, no. Why? We don't know the answer why. We can speculate. Perhaps it would have been a, a stumbling block in his ministry to the Jews, to whom he must preach the gospel first, to have a Gentile among them. But I think there's probably a, a better explanation. This is a test. This was a test. Is this man truly submissive? Because to follow the adventure, to follow the enthusiasm, to follow the adrenaline rush of the man who just healed you, and to say, I would like to go with you. I'd like to travel the world with you. And Jesus says, no, here's what you need to do. You need to go home. Go to the most ordinary place and tell them there what God has done for you. And isn't this true often? When some men get a hold of the gospel, they immediately have these fantastical plans, these big, bold, magnanimous plans to go to foreign lands, to go with their name and lights to preach Christ. And Jesus says to every one of us first, go home. Literally here, <clears throat> the ESV says, go home to your friends. Literally, it's go home to your own. Go home to your own. Can you imagine what that was like? That first dinner, and I don't know, maybe he's returning to his wife, his family. We don't know his biography. But the people that knew him, and now they sit there, and they probably turn their heads a little bit because of the cuts and the wounds. And they just can't imagine. They're still scratching their head going, when's the outburst going to come? What's going to happen next? Because we haven't been within a mile of this man in years because he's dangerous and he's unstable and he's unpredictable and we don't know what's going to happen next. And now he's sitting at our table eating bread with us. He wants to hold our daughter. Should we let him? But he's speaking to us about what Christ has done, what the Son of God has done. 
Jesus has told his disciples, he's told other people in Judea, in the land of Israel, don't mention me, don't speak of me. But to a Gentile, where there was no danger of messianic terms getting confused, he says, go, go and tell them. And he did. He was faithful. And I think it's not, it's not by accident Then we come to places, for example, like Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 2, Paul unfolds the glory of the gospel and all that Christ, all that God has done in Christ Jesus. And then he begins chapter 3 with, put on the new man. And in Paul's thinking and in his writing, do you know where that shows up first? Two places. In your own home and in your local church. You want to do something big for God? You want to rejoice in your conversion? You want to serve him faithfully? Go be a good son, a good daughter. Go be a faithful wife, a faithful husband. Be a faithful brother and sister. The newness of the new man ought to be seen first at home. If it's not seen there, where is it going to be seen? In fact, this is a prerequisite to be an officer in the church of Jesus Christ. That's not by accident. Is the new man really new? If so, we'll see it at home. We will know by his wife and his children and the order of his home. And so a church ought to ask, has this man first gone home and testified there consistently, faithfully, diligently of the mercy of God in his own life? In our ambition, we may aspire to do mighty things in the kingdom of God. But remember, James and John had such aspirations, didn't they? Lord, when you come into your kingdom and we sit on your left hand and your right hand, well, what does Jesus command to the vast majority, the vast majority of his disciples is what? Go home. Go to your own. Bear testimony there. Go to your own families. Go to your own workplaces. Go to your own local church. Go to your own neighborhood, your own community. Don't think that you're going to do something in a faraway land that you won't do here. I want to go preach the gospel to, to, to the wild, to the native, to, to the Gentile and the foreign lands. Have you preached it to anyone here? Have you served faithfully where you are? Be faithful as children to your parents, as parents to your children, as brothers and sisters, as husbands and wives. Be faithful, go home. Be faithful church members. Remember the reality and the cruelty of unseen powers around us. We can't forget that church. We can't overlook that. We can't minimize that. But we also don't live in fear of it because the one who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We are not bound. We are not subject to. We can't, un we can't minimize or refuse to think about the destructive and cruel influences among us and around us. No Christian can be possessed by the devil, but we can be tormented. We can be afflicted. We can be falsely accused. Remember the reality and the cruelty of these unseen powers, but even more than that, remember the overwhelming authority and the overwhelming mercy of God to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then go home. Be faithful where God has put you. Be faithful to speak of him when you have those opportunities. To bear testimony to what God has done for you right where you are. And do not, do not be, allow yourself to be guilted and shamed because you're not doing something mighty in the kingdom of God. I should use scare quotes there. Moms, my dear sisters, do not let anyone tell you you're just a mom or you're just a homemaker or you're just raising your children or you're just teaching and, and, and educating your children. Don't let them do that to you. Go home and praise God for the opportunity you have to tell your children what God has done for you and what God will do for them. Fathers, in your daily grind, and you're laboring to provide for your family, and you're laboring to subdue your own flesh, and you're laboring to provide and love for your own wife and serve her and your children, don't you dare fall into the accusation that you ought to be doing something else for the kingdom of God. Perhaps the Lord will call you in, in some other sphere, 
but not until or unless you're faithful at home. Give your energy there. Give your devotion there. Exercise your faith there and trust that God will bear fruit there for his glory and for your good and for the good of your family and your children's children's children. Amen? Let's pray. Father and our God, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of your awesome and holy, powerful, and merciful Son, we thank you that you have displayed your eternal mercy towards sinners in him. That you so loved this world. And all of its wickedness, and all of its evil, in all of its enmity against you, that you sent your own son to seek and to save the lost. Father, we pray by your Holy Spirit's power that we will see something of ourselves in this demon-possessed man. That we will see ourselves as no less freed from tyranny and bondage and self-destruction as this man was. And that we will see in our own conversion no less power and no less pity and no less mercy shown to us than what the Lord Jesus showed to this man. Fathers, we give our thoughts now to the Lord's table. We pray that we would find in the bread and in the wine, in these visible symbols, a reminder and a participation in the full measure of your mercy poured out to us in the body and blood of your very own Son. We ask this in his name.